Hello friends, this is a complete beginner course for those starting out with Java. I'm Sarah. I have 15 years of hands-on Java experience. I hope this course helps you quickly get started. The course is split into different sections, so feel free to repeat sections or skip sections as required. All the code is written in this course is freely available on my GitHub link. Link is in the description below. So let the awesome journey begin. In this video, we will be talking about what can you do with Java? What is Java? We will download Java. We will download and install Eclipse, which is an integrated development environment for writing code. After that, we will write a basic Hello World Java program. Then we will talk about variables, strings, arrays, and um, operators in Java. We will write code to implement all of these. We will move to the control flow statements, which are the if, uh, if statement, the while, and the for loops. Then we will proceed to the classes, objects, packages, and inheritance, how to implement them in the Java. And we will conclude the Java beginner course by discussing on what to talk about or what course to take next to become a professional Java developer. So why should we learn Java? What can it do for you? Well, there's an impressive list of things that you can do with Java. With Java, you can build all these type of apps. You can build mobile apps, you can write code for IoT devices, you can write cloud, web applications, enterprise applications, scientific applications, also write code for chatbots and games. So now let's see what is Java next. So what is Java? Java is both a platform and a programming language. As a programming language, Java is object oriented. It is portable. It is multi-threaded. It is robust and also secure. Java has its own huge collection of libraries that we can use in our applications. For this course, we will be using Java 20 and Eclipse ID. Java provides Java development environment for building the applications and Java runtime environment for running the applications. JRE is also part of JDK. The code in Java, it is written in plain text files with .java extension. So when you compile this source code, this dot java file it converts into dot class files with dot class files is nothing but it is a byte code which is a language of jvm so byte code is something that is understood by jvm so jvm runs the app jvm runs the program so when you compile the program once it converts into dot class files and now that class dot that dot class file can be run on any operating system with the help of JVM available for that operating system. So JVM is available for Linux, Windows, Solaris. So in that sense, Java is truly a right once run anywhere system. Now that we know what we can do with Java and what is Java, we can start with the course. In the next video, we will download Java 20 on Mac OS. Process is almost similar for downloading Java 20 on Windows. Please let me know in comments below if you would want me to create a video to download Java 20 on Windows. Download the latest version of Java, which is Java 20. So let's see how we can easily do that. So download Java on your browser. Go and type in download Java. You can scroll down all the way to the Oracle website. So oracle.com, Java downloads, I'll click here. As you see, Java 20 is the latest version and we also have Java 17, which is a long-term support version. Today we want to download Java 20. So, so we'll scroll down all the way to the archive and I'm installing for macOS. So I'll go and click macOS and I need is x64 DMG installer. So the file size is 178.53 MB. I'll go ahead and click this link. It will take few seconds before this gets installed. Okay, so once this is installed, let's double click that. JDK20 dot package. I'll double click the package. And here is the setup. 
So it says welcome to JDK 20 installer and just you just follow the steps. Just click on the continue. And it says that it takes 329.2 MB space on your computer. I'll go and click install. It needs my password. And the installation is started. Okay, so the install is succeeded. It says that do you want to move the installer file to the trash? Since the Java is already installer installed, I don't need the Java 20 installer file, so I'll move that to trash. And let's check now the version of the Java. So this is my terminal here. I can just say Java version. And as you see, Java version, let's go and increase the size of the terminal font and the terminal. So here, as you see, Java version 20 got installed. Thank you guys for watching. Now that we successfully installed Java on our machines, we can proceed with downloading Eclipse, which is an integrated development environment where we will be writing all our Java code. We'll download Eclipse for Mac. So in order to do that, go to the browser and type in download Eclipse for Mac. So this is the Eclipse website, eclipse.org. Let's go and click there. Eclipse ORG downloads is the URL. And here, as you see, you can download x86 64 version. This installer includes a JRE for Mac OS. So if you want to download Eclipse for Mac OS, Windows or Linux, you need to use this installer. So I'll go and click on download. This is one more download link. So as you see, it is getting downloaded. It will be few seconds before it's downloaded. And I can click on the installer. So here is my Eclipse installer. Let me go and double click this. So it's getting loaded. The installer is getting loaded and you can you have different options here uh, because I need to develop web applications I want to use Eclipse to develop web applications and so I'll go ahead and choose Eclipse ID for enterprise Java and web developers the version I want to use is JDK 20 so I'll go and select the JDK 20 the prerequisite of Eclipse installation is the Java installation. If you have not, if you are not aware on how to install Java, I have a separate video on that. So please go ahead and look at that video and then, then come over here. So I'll select, I have downloaded JDK 20. So I'll go ahead and select that one. And this is the installation folder, folder user Sarah Eclipse, and then the JE 2023 March. So I'll go and click on the install button. It takes few few minutes to install. So once it is installed, it says installation completed successfully and now we can launch our Eclipse. So let's go ahead and launch it. So, so as the Eclipse is getting launched, you see the workspace, you can define where your all your projects will get stored. Uh, I am happy with this location user Sarah Eclipse workspace. So I'll keep this default location and I'll go ahead and launch the Eclipse.
So our Eclipse for Mac is installed. This is the welcome screen. I'll go ahead and close the welcome screen. Now let's create a simple Java project of printing the hello world on the screen to make sure that our Eclipse and Java is working together. So I'll go ahead and create a project. I'll select Java project here. Go and click next. Project name will be hello world. I will use a project specific JRE which is SE20. Uh, let me configure. Okay, so this we already have an SC20 here in the install JREs. If you do not have that, you can go ahead and select that. So, so I'll apply and close this and I can go and select this SC20 here. So, I don't need module info.java. I don't want to create a module. I just want to print hello world on the screen. So let's go ahead and do that. So it asked me if you want to open a Java perspective. So let's go ahead and click open perspective. Here is my hello world Java project. This is an SRC folder where all my source codes will be present. So I'll go ahead and click new create new class which is it will be in the package say com dot tutorials dot tutorial dot java and i want public static void main which is the main class which is the starting point of a java application And it says the name is empty. So I this is a source folder. This is a package name. And I need to give a class name. So my class name is hello world. And then I can go and click finish. So here is my Java, first Java class that we created. I'll remove this comment. And I'll say system dot out dot println, which will print hello world on the console. And then I'll, I'll click control A. Control A, control shift F, which will format my class. And then I'll go and right click on this Java class and I'll say run as Java application. And as you see, the hello world gets printed. Thank you guys for watching. Next, we will be talking about variables and strings in Java. What is a variable? In simplest terms, variables store data. Variables have data types that allow us to store different types of data. There are eight primitive data types that are provided by Java, byte, short, integer, long, float, double, character, and boolean. The first four, byte, short, integer, and long, they store numbers. Float and double store numbers as well as allow decimal points to be stored. Char care stores single characters. Boolean stores flag kind of a value on off true false so it stores true and false java is statically typed that means all the variables must be declared before they can be used java also provides special type called string that allows you to store words and sentences variable names are case sensitive and they begin they can begin either with letter or with dollar or with an underscore Fine. We will look at what is variables in Java, how to define variables, what are the different data types that Java provides. We will have some examples and we will print those variables. So let's get started. So we will start with an integer variable. INT is stands 
we can define an integer variable using int so integer stores numbers so we can define a number and we will say 34 and I can go ahead and put in this variable So as you see, we see the variable got printed. So, similar to number, we have other data types like byte, short, which allow for smaller numbers to be stored. Byte stores 128 bits, short stores 16 bits, integer stores 32 bits, long stores 64 bits, and then float and double stores decimal points. So let's see an example of float data type. So float, we want to store a decimal number equal to 3.4. And if you want to define that it's a float data type, then we will have F in the end. And I can print this as well. So we have 3.4 printed. Similar to float, double allows for more precision than float. Now let's see what we use Boolean for. Boolean is used for storing true-false kind of values like a flag on or off. So suppose we have a boolean called status which is true and then we can print that value it does not allow for any other value so if I want to see 34 then it will give me an error it will show that change the type of status to an integer it's a mismatch so it can only store true or false now I can also change the value to false and I can, oh, I can print instead of true, I can print status. So as we see, we, see we, we had the status true, then we changed to false and we are printing the status. So we saw how we can define numbers in Java, how we can define decimal numbers in Java, how we can define Boolean variables in Java. Now, care is used for storing single characters. So, so if you want to store something like care, care equal to A, and then, I can go and print that value. So we see the value A is getting printed here. So this is for storing single characters. If I use more than one characters here, then it will say that is an invalid character constant. So you can only have a single uh, variable, single letter in here. Now, if we want to store a string like words or sentences, Java provides a special type called string, which is a class in Java. And you can use this to store numbers. Uh, you can store, use this to store anything actually. You can use things to store numbers. You can use this to store string. So I can say Monday and I can even have a date here. I can say 0405. And then I can go and print this day. It also allows us to store sentences. So I have this group of words or a sentence and then I can go and print it as well. I'll just say it's a sentence and I can go and print the sentence here. 
So as you see, the sentence got printed. So this is how you define different data types in Java and how you can print them. So when you write applications, you will be using these data types to store various kinds of values that you will be using in your program. Thank you. Next, we will see what are arrays in Java and how to use them. Array is a container that holds multiple values of the same data type. So you can have an array of strings, you can have an array of integers, you can also have an array of user-defined types like car, person. The length of an array, it is established at the initialization time. As you see in this diagram below, each item in an array, it is called an element. The elements are accessed using indexes and the index starts with zero. So as you see, this is an array of 10 elements. You can define a number array and a string array and we will print those arrays. So let's get started. So if we want to define a number array, this is a regular number variable. Now, if you add the square brackets, this makes it an array. We, we, we can define this array to store numbers 8, 9. And now we'll also add a 0. And now we can define one more array, which is a string array, and then we will print those arrays. So if you want to define a string array in a similar way, first we will say string days, and then in order to declare it as an array, we can add the square brackets. The square brackets can be in the front of the data type, or it can also be defined here, in the end when near the variable name but the normal convention is to define it after the data type so the days will be Monday, Wednesday, So these are the days that are defined. So this defines as a number array. This is a string array. Now in order to print this array, we will need something called a for loop. So, so that's a loop which will go in sequence from one to zero. And in the case of days from Monday to Sunday. So let's see how we can do that. So first is a regular for statement for and in the bracket there are three things first is the index index of this starts from zero and then the next is till what we want to so it will be numbers dot length Till the end, I want to print this array and then I++ is the increment operator and then I can go and do println if I'll just do print because I want to print everything in the one statement. So print numbers of i. So it will print the ith position and then I will give some space so it will all come on a single line. And I can have a println statement after this. So this for statement says that I want to start printing from zero, zeroth index, that is from this index, all the way till the length of the array, which is 10. And then 
because it is zero so i will say i is less than numbers of length and then we will increment every time this statement is executed it will go and increment uh, the i so first time we will be printing numbers of zero which is now which is first index then numbers of one numbers of two so in that way we can print all the numbers so let's run this as we see here we can print from one till the end of the loop same way for days days there is a if i want to print that i also have one more statement which is for each statement so which is pretty simple we will take a for and we, because this is a string type so i'll say string of d till days so each string d in days i want to print d and then i'll also print some space because i want to print it in a single line so this will internally turn into this for statement and it will loop through all the days and print the days on the same line so when we run the statement we can see that it gets printed thanks next we will be talking about enum in java an enum type is a special data type that allows a variable to have a set of predefined constants you should use enum types any time you need to represent a fixed set of constants for example planets of a solar system or days of a week or months of an year let's see an example we can define an enum type in order to define an enum type we will have an enum keyword and say we want to define days of the week so enum is a predefined set of constants so days of the week cannot be more than the seven days that we have right so it is usually used to define those constants that are predefined and are not changing say days of the week or the months of the year or something similar so so let's define an enum so and the, another convention is each and every constant is usually defined using uppercase letters you can define it using a lowercase letter as well but the normal convention is to define it using an uppercase letter So this is our enum, which has predefined constants all the way from Monday to Sunday. And now we will see how we can use this enum. So I can declare a variable of this enum class. So days of the week, and I want to say today, which is say, I want to pick days of the week. Now I cannot, if I have a variable defined, I cannot now go and define something, something else here. This won't work. It will give a compiler error that this cannot be resolved to a type. So I need to, it needs to be out of this variable. Okay, O is not capital, so it has to be days of week. I have to just select from one of the days. Maybe I'll just select a Saturday. So this is how you can define a variable and you can select one of the values over here. Now, uh, let's see how we can use it. So suppose I have a logic, something that says a switch statement which will switch out of the number of the cases that we have so i'm going to say switch today so if it is saturday i want to do this if it is wednesday i want to do this if it is tuesday i want to do this so for each of these cases we will just print have a print statement so so monday and then
and then we also have a break and we will copy this for all the cases that we have And the last one is Sunday. And we can have a default case. If it doesn't fall in any of the other cases, so we can have a default case, which will tell that it is an invalid day. So let's run this and as we selected Saturday here, we can print that it's a Saturday. Next, we will be talking about operators in Java and we will see an example on how to implement operators. Operators that are available for use in the applications are arithmetic operators, unary operators, equality operators, relational operators, conditional operators. We will see an example on how to use all of these operators in our application. How we can use different types of operators in the code. So we will talk about arithmetic operators, unary operators, equality and relational operators, as well as conditional operators. So let's start with arithmetic operators. So I will define an integer type operand 1 with the value of 10, integer operand 2, say with the value of 5, and integer result, which will be operand 1 plus operand 2, and then sysout. So we will do addition first. This is how you can use plus operator, just a regular addition with operand 1 trying to add to operand 2 and the value will be stored in the result and then we are printing the result. So when we save and run this, we get 15. We can do similar for all other operators equal to operand 1 minus parent 2 and then we can again print the result then we can use operand 1 multiply by operand 2 then we can print the result then we can say operand 1 divided by operand 2 then we can print it again so addition subtraction multiplication division and then we have a modulo operator which will give us the remainder so operand 1 modulo operand 2 and then it will we can print this result so as you see we have the result printed here for all of them 10 plus 5 15 subtraction multiplication 50 division 2 and the remainder is 0
Now for unary operators, we can say result equal to plus plus operand 1. And then we can print the result. And then result, you can also do post operand 2. Plus plus post unary. And then you can print this value. So, so when you print this, you have 10 and 5 printed. So operand 1 was 10 turned to 11 and here operand 2 was 5 but this plus plus we are incrementing after we are assigning to the result so the value still stays the same which is 5 for equality operators we can say if run 1 is greater than operand 2 Then we want to print the value 1 is greater and we can copy this and then change the operator for all of them to try to use and see all of them. So greater than, then there is greater than equal to, then there is less than. Then we have less than equal to. We also have double equal to. And we have not equal to. So it's greater is greater and equal to is less is less than equal to is equal operands are equal here and operands are not equal so we have so we can define it again Operand 1 is 10, operand 2 is 10. So in that case, we will have operand 1 is greater than, let's see what happens in this case. So when we run this, so it is, great, it is greater than or equal to, so we will have operand is greater than or equal to printed, equal to, less than or equal to and then operands are equal. So we have all these three statements printed. So this way you can use all of these greater than, greater than, equal to, less than, less than, equal to, equal to and not equal to operators. It's very simple here. Conditional operators are when you use two conditions together. Say suppose you have <coughs> if operand one equal to equal to operand two, and you want to combine this condition with another condition, then you can do that. Say we have operand 3 greater than operand 4. Then we can say condition is true. So let's define operand 3 and operand 4. So let's let's have the value of operand 1 is 10, operand 2 is 10, and then we have 3 is 10 again, and then we have operand 4 is 5. And this we can define it in teacher integer compiler was complaining because it wasn't defined now that we have defined it and then we can run this and we can say that this condition is true if we change this value and make it 15 then the second condition will be false in which case you this value won't be printed so we won't have condition is true the next is or 
you can use exactly the same thing but in this case the first any it says that any of this condition is true then we want to print that condition is true so in this case operand 1 is 10 operand 2 is 10 is equal so this condition is true but operand 3 is greater than operand 4 is wrong is false but since only one condition is true or says that any of one condition is true then the output is true and says that any of both the conditions needs to be true in order to print the statement so let's go and check that and we see that condition is true in the case of second true for or so when we print this it says condition is true for or Next, we will be talking about control flow statements in Java. Control flow statements that are provided by Java are if else, switch statement, while, do while, and for loops. Let's see an example on how to use all of these in Java. Here we will see how we can use different control flow statements that are provided by Java. So, different control flow statements as we discussed are if else, switch, while, do while. And for statement so let's start with if else statement uh, so suppose we'll take an example of if we'll have a variable declared if say integer test score is 90 now based on this variable we want to print grade A or print grade B. So if the test score is greater than 90, then I want to print print ln grade A else I want to print grade B. It's good idea to include this braces if there is just one single line that you need to write after the condition you can skip the braces but it's a good convention to best practice to have the braces to very clearly identify the code so I'll do control a control shift F which is formatting so so here if we are saying that if the test score is greater than 90 then we want to print grade a else if test score is greater than is less than 90 then we want to print grade b so let's run this and we see that it is b so if i have a score as 95 and if i print this then i get grade a so switch statement you can use when you want to you have multiple if conditions so say i want to define switch case for grade a grade b grade c then i can do that as well so again we will take test score is say suppose 80 and then i am doing a switch statement based on test score i have different cases defined so i'm saying case 90 then I want to print grade A and then I'll have a break so it will break out of the switch switch is defined switch then test score and then we have this braces that define that then I'm saying that case 80 and then this will be grade B and then we have break and then case say suppose 60 and then for 60 i have c and then break and then in any other case i can have a default case defined which will be just a default word and i can say grade d
I can save this, I can format it. So I am saying, so if the test score is 80, I should print the statement as grade B. And then if I have something like 50, then I'll print D. If it is 60 or more, then it will print C. If it is 80 or more, then it will print B. If it is 90 or more, then it will print A. So this is how you can use switch statement. Instead of using multiple ifs, the switch is a better idea. Now let's see how we can use while and do while statement. While statement is very simple. So if you have a number, say integer number equal to 10. Now while, this is how you start the while statement. While, uh, then there will be a condition. If it is greater than zero, then we want to print the number plus the space so that we print on the same line. If I do print ln, that is, it will go to the next line, but I want to print on the same line. Also, another very important thing is number plus plus, number minus minus. We want to decrement this because we are starting with 10. If we were starting with zero and you are going till a particular condition, you can increment it. If you are starting with a higher number and you are you want to go below all the way to zero, then you can have minus minus. So this is number and then minus minus. And then when I print this, I have all the numbers printed starting from 10. Then it will print a number. It will decrement the number. It will again go back, check the condition. Now the value is nine. It is still greater than zero. It will go and print the number. It will decrement the number and then go. Do while is a little almost similar to while, just that the first statement is always printed. It checks the condition after the first statement. So suppose number is greater than zero. Out dot print ln. I'll just have a simple print statement so that it goes on the next line. And then I'm again initializing the number with 10. And then I'm saying if the number is, I'm having the same statements in here. So this is, but in the, the difference between while and do while is the first statement will always be executed. It will check the condition after the first statement. So, so this also prints all the way from 10 to one. So that's a do while, that's our do while statement. This is while, this is do while. And now we have a for statement. So for is, Again, a looping condition, which is very useful and it has been used everywhere in the Java from the beginning. So let's see how we can write a for statement. So we have sub, we will use a different variable. So we'll use a J, say as an index. We again want to print the numbers say from zero to 10. So we'll start with zero. We'll second statement is a condition. J is less than or equal to 10. We want to print 0 to 10. And then we can say j plus plus, increment it. So for, then we will have, here we don't need to give an increment or a decrement condition because that is part of this first for statement. So instead of this, I want to print j. So this way I can print, okay, let me have a separate line so that we can see it clearly on a separate line. So when I run this, I have the numbers printed from index zero all the way till 10. And the increment in the case of four is part of the same for statement. You don't need to define it separately like in the case of while and do while. 
Next, we'll be talking about classes, objects, and packages in Java. A class in a Java is like a blueprint or a template from which objects are created. For example, we have in the real world a car blueprint from which real cars are made. Here, blueprint is a class and real cars are objects. Software objects also have state and behavior just like real world objects. For example, in the case of car, the state is its current attributes like its make, model, year, while its behavior is its actions or operations it can perform like starting, accelerating, braking, etc. Packages, they help you organize your code so that it becomes easy to manage. Let's see an example now of packages, classes, and objects in the next video. In a package, we will define class in a package and we will use this, use that class and print its member variables. So we want to define a package called employees and a class called employee. So in order to define a package, we'll go to SRC folder, right click, new package so the name of package will be com.tutorial.employees so in eclipse i have this package created in this package i want to create a class which will be an employee class So here is what I have, a public class employee. I am going to define two member variables in it, which is string name. The employee will have a name and integer age, the age of the employee. So our class is a public class, so it can be accessed out of this package as well, which is our intention because we want to call this class from a different, different class and print its member variables. In order to instantiate this class, we will need a constructor, which will set the employee's name and age. So the way you define a constructor is you have the same name as a class name. There is no return type because this is not a method. This is this is a constructor. And you can have the same names as well for the parameters of the constructor. And then we will use this. This is a special keyword that is used to tell that whenever we are instantiating a new member variable for a class, in when we are instantiating an object, then this name value will be same as whatever is passed to the constructor. So I want to tell that this dot name equal to name that is passed in the parameter. Same for age. This dot age equal to age. So this tells us that when this employee object is instantiated, its member variables name and age will be set to the values that are passed in the constructor. Besides this, I will also need a getter and setter to uh, get the variables and set them if they are required. So in Eclipse, it's very simple to generate getter and setters. You just go to the source and generate getter setters and then I'll do select all and I'll say generate. So now we have an employee class, which is public class. We also need the constructor to be public because we need to call the constructor from outside of this class and then we will need the public getter and setter methods. However, the variables 
they are not public we don't want anyone outside of class to call these member variables and set them directly they this member variables can be set only either using a getter setter method or using a constructor so now let's create a class that will call this employee class so let, so the class that i want is class usage in java and it will have a main method in this main method i want to define the variables of an employee class now in order to access if i just type in employee class employee and i create emp1 equal to new employee and say suppose if i pass in teddy and if i pass in 25 it will give me an error because it does not know because the employee class is not present in this package this is a separate package in order to use this employee class i will need to import the employee class from that package so i can do that using an import statement import com dot tutorial dot employees so once i import that package i i can import that specific class as well i can import this specific class as well so let's go and do that let's employ let's uh, import just this specific class and now i can use the employee class so i have an emp1 variable the employee one created which is steady and then i can also create one more employee the second employee i want to create using a setter so two dot set name equal to i'll say fred and emp2 dot set age equal to as a 30. now as you see this one v is not initialized we need to initialize this variable so if we say here none so now where I can print the values system dot out dot println emp employee no I'll say teddy okay I'll say emp one name which is going to be plus emp one dot get name semicolon here and then same thing i want to say for emp2 which will be emp2 dot get name now this one throws an exception why it throws an exception because there is no default constructor and this value is null so we have not instantiated this variable this um, this employee instance field so when we are creating the employee object 2 we are not instantiating why is that employee we don't have any default constructor here by default if we if we did not have this constructor then then java would create a default constructor but if we define a default constructor then if we do not have a if we have defined one more constructor we need to define a default constructor so let's go ahead and define a default constructor so this is the default constructor so once we have defined the default constructor we can say now new employee And now when we run it, 
we get EMP1 is steady and EMP employee 2 is Fred. We can also print the age. So we will say age is emp1.h, emp1.getH and same for employee 2. We will say age and plus emp2.getH. Then we save it and we run. So now you see, we can see the name Teddy. Let me have some space after the name getting printed. So maybe I can have a space over here. Save it and run it again. I have the name and the age of both the employees printed. So what we did in this example is we created an employee class. We saw how we can create a class in Java. We can, we created a new package. We saw how we can create a package. We added the instance variables, the member variables of this class. We defined two constructors. One is a default constructor. This comes by default, but if you define another constructor, you need to have a default. You need to define a default constructor manually. So we saw how to, how to create constructors and then we have getters and setters for all the member fields and in eclipse it is very easy to do that we can just say source and then generate getter and setters then we created this another class we imported the package and we created two objects of the employee class two instances <coughs> And for these two objects, we set their name, one by the constructor, another by using a setter method, and then we printed both the employee objects. Next, we'll look at what are interfaces in Java and how to implement them. An interface in Java is a reference type, which is similar to a class, but it can only contain constants, abstract methods which are methods without a body and static and default methods. The methods that only contain implementation are default and static methods. Interfaces cannot be instantiated just like class. They can only extend by another interface. They can only be extended by another interface or they can be implemented by a class. If a class decides to implement an interface, then it needs to implement all the methods of an interface. Let's see an example. In this video, we will see how we can define an interface in Java and how we can define a class that implements that interface. And we will define a class with the main method that will call the class that implements the interface and print some values. So let's get started. So I'll define a vehicle interface. In order to define an interface, I'll say new. I'll go to interface here. The name is vehicle. And then in the vehicle interface, I will define some constants because interface can contain some constants as well. So integer, say max, speed equal to 100 and then I can define some abstract methods something like void start void stop I can also define static methods something like void print static white print and uh, because it's a static method I can provide the implementation so I will say this is a vehicle interface so this does not belong to an instance this will belong to a class in this case this will belong to an interface I can also 
define some default methods in an interface for a default method I can say turn on radio and then I can provide the implementation So we defined a vehicle interface, we defined constant max speed, we also defined some abstract methods, we defined a static method with the implementation, we defined some, okay, so this is a default method, so we, we need to specify it's a default method. So we, do, we specified some static method and also some default methods. Now let's create a class and use this vehicle interface. So I'll create a new class called car. And this car will implement, when you want to implement an interface, you actually write the word implement and then you say vehicle. So now I can see implements. And then now I can see that it does because I implemented the vehicle interface, I need to implement those unimplemented methods, those abstract methods. That is mandatory. So I'll just in Eclipse, it's very simple. I'll just go ahead here and say add unimplemented methods. So these are the two methods that come from the interface. So I can just say car started because this is car specific implementation. And then again, I can say car stopped. And then I'll just format this class. So now we have a class car that implements vehicle interface. It gets all the values that it needs. And plus it um, also, we also implemented specific implementation for the car, which is start and stop method. Now we will use this we will have a new class that will use this car met car class that implements the vehicle interface. So let's create one more class, new class, interface usage in Java. And this will have a main method. In this method now when I'm creating an instance variable I can specify actually that I need an instance of a vehicle which is of type car and new car so now we have this interface I can provide an interface and new car the the when I say new car at the runtime, the object of type car is created. Now I can I can print out its start method. I can print its stop method. Also, I can print its de uh, default method. So let's see. Let's run this program and see. So we see the car stopped, car started, car stopped, and radio is on. So this is how we can create an interface with all these different things that interface allows. We can create a class that implements the specific implementation, and then we can use that in use, then we can use that by defining a variable of the type interface. Next, we will look at what is inheritance in Java and how to implement inheritance in Java. In Java, the concept of inheritance is very powerful. Suppose you want to write a new class and if there is an existing class that has some of the code that you need, then you can derive your new class from an existing class. In doing so, you reuse some of the fields and the methods from an existing class. The derived class is called a subclass and the parent class is called a superclass. So inheritance is a mechanism 
where a class can inherit the properties and the behavior of another class. The subclass that is created, it can extend or modify the superclass by adding new methods or variables or by overriding existing methods. Let's see an example. In this video, we will see how we can implement inheritance in Java. For that, we will create a class and then we will define another class that will inherit from that class as well as we will have a usage class that will have public static void man main method that will use and show the power of inheritance. So let's get started. So I will define a new class called animal class. In this class, I will have a string name, integer age. Then I will have an animal constructor with string name, integer age. And we'll say this dot name equal to name and this dot age equal to age. We will also define two methods, which is something like public void eat and system dot println eating. And then we will have something similar, but we will say sleep and then sleeping. So now we have defined an animal class with name age, its constructor and eat and sleep methods. Now let's define one more class, which is cat. So this cat class, in order to implement inheritance, will say extends animal class. Now, since the animal class has a constructor in here, the cat class will also need to use or have the constructor. So I'll just say add the same constructor and it will call the super, that is the super class constructor. So the super keyword here calls the super class constructor. So it will call an animal constructor and will set the values as we need them. Besides the regular methods that animal class has, now the cat class will also have one more method called mu or meow. And then I can just say out print ln and then meow. So we have the animal as super class or the parent class and then we have this cat class which is a subclass or a child class that implements the, that extends the animal class. Now let's define a class that will use these both classes. So let's define a class called inheritance usage in Java with the main method. And here we can call a cat class, new cat with name as Tom, age as two. And for this cat class, we can call all the methods that are defined in the superclass as well as in the subclass. So let's call the superclass methods first, which is eat. And then we can call sleep. And then we can call the new method, which is defined only in the subclass. So as you see, we since cat extends animal class, we are able to call the superclass methods as well as the subclass method. Now let's run this. And we can see the output as getting printed from both these classes. Congrats for completing the basic Java course. It's a great achievement and I wish all the best for you. Once again, all the code in this course is in the GitHub link in the description for each of these sections. Please let me know if this video helped you in your journey and don't forget to comment below. And also, I would like to hear from you. 
if you could recommend me on which course you want me to publish next. Thank you, guys.